The Army says its first hypersonic missile flight test should happen toward the end of this fiscal year. The new weapon will launch from the back of a mobile vehicle. Frank Kendall, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, he's former Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Frank, welcome. It's good to see you again. I quote from Jen Judson's piece in Defense News about this: "The Army expects to deliver in a little more than 200 days from start to finish the first hypersonic weapon capability to a unit." A service official said, "That sounds like a tremendously compressed schedule. That's an acquisition success story. It sounds like to me. Is that fair to say?" Well, there isn't many things, Francis. The devil's in the details. Uh, you know, I, I applaud what they're doing. I don't have any problem with the fact that they've emphasized schedule here to try to get a product out. Uh, the question I would have, though, is how much capability are they actually building? And how much do they need? And when's the next increment going to come? So they get to what I would consider an operationally meaningful uh, capability. You know, having one battery with a couple of rounds is nice. It, uh, it gives you experience, and you can learn a lot from that. But in terms of an operational capability, it's pretty limited. You know, I think what they've done is use prototypes effectively uh, to get to that initial, uh, uh, what they're calling is a lead behind capability from the prototyping program. And what we really ought to be taking a look at is when they get uh, significant force uh, field. Uh, that's what I'd be more concerned about at this point. The, uh, the piece says the only element that won't be delivered to the unit until fiscal 2023 is a live round. I, I mean, I, I understand that that's probably the most important capability because that's what we want the missile to deliver. But what, what should we look at in between now and then for this capability? Because this is something that um, I understand is really important to try to counter China and Russia who are already developing this technology. Now, think of this system, I think, as a conventional version of Pershing, okay? It's a longer range missile. Uh, it's going to have a conventional warhead. The fact that it's a hypersonic means it it has a boost glide vehicle on the front end instead of a, uh, a weapon that's just thrown ballistically, basically. So it can penetrate defenses much better. Uh, the time on target is relatively, roughly similar to, to a ballistic missile. Uh, it, it doesn't get there all that much faster, but when it does get there, it's a lot harder to intercept. Um, and it has a much wider range of targets which it could potentially service. So that's all good. Uh, the weapon system isn't a weapon system until it has some munitions. And the things I'd be looking for are the, the flight test program and its success. You're not going to field until you have, uh, in quantity, until you've demonstrated that it, it works reliably and consistently. So they need to do that. So the other thing I'd be looking at is the budget. Uh, how many are funded? Uh, what's the inventory objective that goes with the with the fit up when they submit that? Now, the programs, I don't think the program uh, is a so-called program of record yet. It, it needs to get into the budget, and the Army needs to show its commitment to actually fielding in quantity. How much of that depends on what else is going on in this broader discussion about the Army, Navy, Air Force, what the pay-fors are, and all of that, Frank? Yeah, I think if budgets are flat, and I think the best case is probably something like flat, maybe down a little bit, uh, you know, at the end of the, you know, the debate that will happen over the next year or so, uh, then people have to look at, okay, what growth were they expecting and planning on that they, they're going to have to cut back on to get within that? Uh, so there'll be a question at the Army level, and then another question at the DOD level, uh, maybe even at the national level, about what the priorities are. I think the system's important. Um, the capability that I'm really looking forward to seeing out of this system is a land-based anti-ship capability. Uh, that's, that's the way you counter China's uh, power projection capability in the South Pacific. And I think this system could be very, very valuable in that context. So I really hope it moves forward. Is there something that we can learn from the development process, the deployment process, the acquisition process of this, Frank, to apply to either other systems, well, systems of record, this one is not one yet, but uh, to systems of record or to systems that come along behind it? Uh, not yet. Um, I, I, like it can, you can build something that does some basic functionality pretty quickly to build something that meets all of your requirements and operates reliably in a range of environments and so on, uh, that's harder. And it isn't clear that the Army's actually done that yet. So we'll, we'll see, okay? Um, I, I've watched a lot of these programs that try to go quickly. Schedules were really emphasized the last few years. And what often happens is you get something out very quickly that you don't like very much, and then you have to go redesign it. So I think the, the big question mark on this program is, what additional work will have to be done to make it truly operational? And the other thing is uh, the weapon is just a part of the system. 
you've got to do the targeting, you've got to do the battle command, you've got to do the other things that are necessary to make it an effective weapon. And you have to integrate it into your operational plan. So I'd be interested in all of those things uh, before I declare this a full success. But again, I do applaud what they've done. I think it's great that they've been able to move quickly and get as far as they have. Uh, people should be prepared to, for some hiccups going forward before they finish the job. We have about a minute left, Frank, and that I, I want to close on kind of a philosophical question. What you're talking about there, it sounds to me like, is determining the right balance between moving quickly and moving maybe effectively is not the right word, but it's the, the best one I can think of on short notice. Is that kind of what you're thinking about there, what you're alluding to? Yeah, I have a lot of experience with programs in the you know, decades, many decades now. And, and I've seen people push for schedule before. The usual result is that you cut corners and take risk, then you have problems and you have to go back and fix them. And you end up taking longer. So we'll see what happens in this case. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This is a relatively straightforward system except for the boost glide vehicle, which is the hard part here. And they've had some degree of success with that. And they're, they're basing their design on an older Sandia design, uh, which, which has helped. So there's more experience with this design or one like it than, than you might expect. So we'll see. Then of course, as it integrates into operations, the users are gonna take a hard look at it, decide you know, how it really fits in and what they need. I mean, I applaud what the Army's done here. This is an, in some sense, I mentioned Pershing, this is in some sense a non-traditional thing for the Army at least in the last few decades. So it's great that they've done this. I, I question whether they were committed to this, this mission specifically when I was still in office. And so far it seems like they are, so I really applaud them. Frank, thanks very much for joining me. Great to have you as always. Thank you, good to be with you, President.